Welcome to the Greener Way podcast, a show about people, planet, and purpose, and how investors and corporate leaders push forward in a complex world. This episode, we're joined by Dr. James Cocaine, New South Wales's first anti-slavery commissioner. It's the 10th anniversary of the factory collapse at Rana Plaza in Bangladesh, a tragedy that left more than a thousand people dead and galvanized a global conversation on companies' responsibility to eliminate modern slavery in their operations and in their supply chains. As we hit this sad milestone, it's a time to reflect on progress, challenges, and where we go to from here. So James, thank you so much for joining us on this episode. Could you please start off by explaining your role as the New South Wales Anti-Slavery Commissioner um, and how the New South Wales modern slavery legislation differs from the Federal Modern Slavery Act? Yeah. Hi, Rachel. Great to be with you. Nice to be with all your listeners. Uh, So I'm the first, as you said, independent anti-slavery commissioner in New South Wales, the state of Australia. Confusingly, there are two modern slavery acts, both passed in 2018, one in New South Wales, one at the federal level. Uh, The federal one that you've just mentioned to date has really focused on corporate due diligence arrangements. So uh, entities, uh, large commercial entities in Australia have to disclose annually uh, a modern slavery statement explaining what they've done to identify and address modern slavery risks in their supply chains and operations. That's at the federal level. Uh, At the New South Wales level, we have an act that after some revision ultimately does not drive in that lane. It drives in some very different lanes. So closest to the corporate due diligence, we have functions in my office to oversee the reasonable steps taken by public buyers, so public procurement uh, by New South Wales government, by local councils, by other entities, reasonable steps to, to ensure they are not buying goods and services made with modern slavery. And then I have a whole range of other uh, functions, nothing to do with procurement, to uh, improve the identification of those at risk of modern slavery and victimised by modern slavery, and to improve the support that they have access to, the referrals uh, that they receive to service uh, organisations uh, and so forth. So would you say that your role, James, um, is around that education and empowerment? Um, Is there investigative powers within your office as well? Um, How how do you fulfill those particular responsibilities within the state of New South Wales? Yeah, so my functions do include awareness raising and improving access to information, education and training, but they also include uh, assisting and uh, referring to further support. Uh, people who come forward and say that they are victims of modern slavery. We don't have formal investigative powers in that context, but we do have quite strong information gathering powers, both to ensure that we can make the right referrals, but also to ensure uh, that the system is performing as a whole. So uh, although I'm appointed by the governor, uh, the, the office exists thanks to an act of parliament in New South Wales, and I report annually to parliament. And one interesting development under the New South Wales legislation is that there's a New South Wales Parliament Modern Slavery Committee, first modern slavery committee in a parliament in Australia. Uh, And so uh, the committee is able to look at these issues from a thematic and structural perspective. Part of my job in using my information gathering powers is to report at least annually to the committee on these trends and developments and to uh, indicate how we're going in addressing challenges in the system uh, that are giving rise to either risks of modern slavery or that are preventing us effectively remedying modern slavery when it does arise. And we think that there's between uh, 600 and 6,000 cases of modern slavery just in New South Wales uh, based on official estimates. Big order of magnitude difference in those estimates mm. because it's difficult to get uh, the actual cases because it's a hidden crime. Uh, mm. But even those numbers suggest that we have a significant challenge here inside New South Wales. So this isn't linked to uh, modern slavery in supply chains outside New South Wales or outside Australia. We're just talking about here in New South Wales. Mm-hmm. When we factor in those uh, those broader connections through supply chains, for example, we're talking about a significantly increased problem. According to the ILO, uh, 50 million cases of modern mm-hmm. slavery around the world. 
And just in case some of our listeners um, need this clarification, when we talk about operations, we're talking about what happens within a particular business. And when we talk about a supply chain, we're talking about how um, materials and goods and services come into a business and then go out of a business. So if we're talking, you know, as a newsroom, I think of paper. Um, so the paper manufacturer, but then where the paper pulp comes from and who cuts down the trees and who sends those trees to the factory. Um, I always try and think of it that way when I'm thinking about supply chains. Now, now, um, I want to come back to this question of remedy or remediation, because I think this is a really big sticking point. Um, but before we get there, you did mention that there are certain um, questions and challenges. So, James, what are you coming across in your role um, when you're dealing with New South, within New South Wales, within business, within uh, government, about the issue of identifying modern slavery and then moving through um, separately to that remediation question? Look, in a sense, uh, Rachel, the, those are the two questions. First of all, <laughs> how, how do we identify it, especially mm -hmm. given you know that we don't necessarily always know where the trees were that were that were grown and then chopped down to provide the paper that we have in our newsroom. Um, we have these long, complex supply chains that go through so many layers, so far from the ultimate buyer and user. So how do we actually identify modern slavery risks? That's a, that's a perennial question we get. And then we also get the question, okay, we've identified the risks. Now what do we do to address the risks and where the risks become harm, unfortunately, then what is our role in remedying that harm? And we, interestingly, we get that question from both corporate entities who might uh, in some cases, not be sure really what their role is properly understood, um, through to entities that are more within government that recognise, okay, we are the government, we have some um, public good expectations, if not mandate, but it's still not necessarily clear to those organisations what the expectations are around the steps they should take to remedy the situation. So a lot of the work we'll be doing really over the next uh, few years is to help provide answers to those questions. And that's quite a complex piece of work. Just if we think just narrowly about the public procurement angle, in here in New South Wales, we have uh, something like 15,000 uh, public officials who at one time or another during a year will be involved in public procurement. Mm -hmm. Under the legislation, we have over 320 different entities that have to report to us on mm -hmm. the reasonable steps they're taking to address modern slavery. We're talking about uh, around $35 billion uh, Australian annually spent on these activities just in New South Wales. Mm. Uh, so this is a big, complex process of change mm. to help the system get better at first, just identifying where this risk is, and then second, knowing what are the reasonable steps that they should take to address it, because not all risks are created equal. And the tendency, of course, in many organizations is to start by looking at risks to the organization, risk mm -hmm. to the business. Mm. But in this area, as in many other human rights areas, actually, we need to turn that impulse around and start by focusing on what are the greatest risks to people. Mm -hmm. uh, so we need to understand any given procurement, not just from the way that it exposes the organization to risk, but actually how large scale how uh, deep the potential harm is and how difficult it is uh, to remedy uh, mm. if, if that harm is actually produced. These are mm. all big changes which are going to require many years of engagement by these organisations to adapt their existing processes and their way of seeing their supplier portfolio, uh, their own operations, as you were mentioning before, uh, to understand where they may be encountering people at risk of bond slavery, and then what they can do to help prevent uh, vulnerability becoming victimization. James, uh, what is the role of your of your office? Um, are you acting as an information aggregator in terms of passing on best practice to the government departments and the businesses that you engage with? Um, is it to go through and using those investigative powers to um, establish where their suboptimal processes is a little bit of all of the above? So it's certainly our role, Rachel, to try and help people find their way to better practice. And we do that mm. partly through convening them to develop good practice. I have a power, for example, to issue codes of practice uh, for uh, identifying and addressing modern slavery in particular supply chains. 
Uh, we're working very closely with government entities to help them understand what reasonable steps will actually look like. Uh, and we're working towards publishing guidance on that in the middle of the year, which is likely to end up for some of them effectively with the force of law. Uh, we don't have investigative powers per se, but the information gathering powers that we do have will certainly use to look for those patterns and uh, signs of blockages in the way the system delivers good outcomes for people and then work with the affected parties to try and remove those blockages over time. In some, in some cases, that may be within our power to work directly with entities, uh, but in other cases, it might, for example, require a legislative reform. And that's where our ability to work directly with Parliament will be very important going forward. Also, there are uh, signs that there may be a federal anti-slavery commissioner, uh, perhaps as soon as later this year. And the Australian Capital Territory Parliament is also considering a bill uh, to that would lead to the appointment of a commissioner in that uh, jurisdiction. So there is uh, evidence that there's a movement in this direction to have commissioners playing this kind of uh, system change role, looking across the system, understanding what's working, what's not, helping actors within the system understand how to better identify and address these these challenges. James, it's been, as we said at the beginning, 10 years since the factory collapse at Rana Plaza, which sparked mm. uh, a lot of this conversation um, and the results that we've seen. How do you assess progress on eradicating modern slavery since then? Look, I think there's good news and bad news. The bad news, mm. unfortunately, is that we have in raw terms seen an absolute increase in modern slavery around the world. According to the ILO's uh, global estimates, there was a 25% uh, worsening of the situation in just four years over the period of the pandemic uh, mm. because a lot more people were vulnerable and there were fewer, they had, they had worse access to protections during that period. Uh, very much the pandemic, of course, disrupted the same kinds of supply chains that had been directly affected by the tragedy of Rana Plaza and so many other uh, less reported tragedies of uh, workplace uh, abuse, exploitation and harm in that sector. The good news, though, I think, is that we, we do see an awakening to uh, the ways that the, we've organised global supply chains, how they outsource risk onto those most vulnerable. And it's not only in jurisdictions like New South Wales, of course, that we now see these strong steps to try and address this. New South Wales is the first jurisdiction that places legal obligations on public buyers to uh, take these kinds of positive steps to address these risks. But of course, that's part of a much larger wave of efforts to use uh, supply chain due diligence to address negative social outcomes, uh, including, of course, uh, through the National Modern Slavery Act here in Australia, the UK Modern Slavery Act, but also the move towards mandatory human rights due diligence uh, across Europe. Uh, and important steps also in this direction in a number of different areas in the United States. It's part of a larger recognition and an awakening, as I'm, I would say, uh, that the way we organise our global supply chains has real life consequences for people all around the world. And if we want to avoid those kinds of uh, human rights harms, we have to get better at bringing the true costs of production and distribution of these goods and services back into the, uh, the way that we price these goods and services, these investments, and the way that we regulate their consumption. James, I wanted to focus in on two terms that we've sort of used through this interview, because I think there's sort of the crux of um, where reforms may need to go, I'm led to believe. Um, so the first phrase being due diligence, and that second phrase being remedy and remediation. Um, mm -hmm. So I'm given to understand that, um, obviously, the, the standard that the European Union is bringing in around doing proper investigation of exposures to supply to um, modern slavery within operations and supply chain, um, that due diligence part, that there, that needs to be strengthened here in Australia. Do you have any views from what you've seen from your particular remit um, around the due diligence process and identification of risk and exposure? Yeah, so due diligence in this context is quite an expansive concept and it deals not only with the idea of checking out the bona fides of a supplier before you 
decide to buy from them. And it's, it's an ongoing activity that involves active engagement with the supplier to conduct ongoing due diligence to understand what kinds of impacts are they having on their workers, on the communities that they deal with, uh, through the way that they're producing and uh, and distributing goods. Um, we have here in Australia, under the existing approach to the Federal Modern Slavery Act, uh, a very strong and clear commitment from the government uh, that that will be in line with the UN guiding principles on business and human rights, the overarching normative framework that governs a lot of this work around the world. So that's really important. There is a, a clear policy commitment from government to this uh, robust best practice understanding of due diligence. But the way that that's implemented in practice has sometimes left a little to be desired, including the the depth of uh, commitment and resource allocation within companies that are carrying out these due diligence uh, obligations. Uh, so there's st- certainly room for improvement there. Not only on the part of companies, though, but also, frankly, on the part of governments, federal and and state level, to help companies find their way to best practice and to make sure that the incentive structures we're setting up are rewarding those that perform well on this dimension and maybe rewarding less those that don't perform so well. And then that connects across to the the question of remedy, that that we have to... Uh, the, the expectation under the prevailing international standards is not just that you look for this risk, but then when you find that the risk has actually led to harm, depending mm-hmm. on the relationship you have to that harm, then you will actually undertake very specifically specific remedial obligations, not just to remedy the way that the product or, ser- or service is made, but actually to remedy the harm to the individuals involved. And I think it's unquestionable that that's an area that here in Australia and, and elsewhere, there's still some distance to go. It's it's not easy to do this well. Uh, mm. It's not easy to show that you're doing it well and to understand from the perspective of those who have been harmed, whether they are getting access to effective remedial obligations. And because mm. this is a bit of a departure from traditional business practice, as understood by some, it's taking a while for different entities in the value chain. So the supplier, the buyer, the investor, to understand what each of their roles is in enabling and providing these remedial arrangements along Mm. these very complex transnational supply chains. It's very easy when you have so many players in the game for them all to point at each other and say, not my responsibility. And I think what we're seeing emerge now is some quite sophisticated multi-stakeholder approaches for ensuring that actually these two things, due diligence and remedy, work effectively together in particular value chains. So in the electronic supply chain, for example, We have very interesting multi-stakeholder mechanisms emerging that give workers in the factories making the products the ability not only to express their grievances, but Mm -hmm. to use that information from grievances to inform the due diligence process. So creating a, a nice feedback loop there between the two so that they reinforce each other. And you ultimately get not only better, greater effectiveness, but also greater efficiency. I think there's also um, Property Council of Australia that, that group that works together um, to handle um, cleaners and security guards. I think as a pilot, I think they've gone more expansive and that is also a really interesting model for efficiency of single questionnaire and then using resources to educate suppliers on how to um, increase their performance on this. That's right. And I think what Mm. that points to is that a lot of these problems are the result of systemic failures, not necessarily, Mm. it's a bit like climate change. None of Mm -hmm. us set out through our carbon emissions to produce the externalities of climate change. But Mm -hmm. the reality is that we all, in our own way, do contribute to that system outcome. So if we want to change the outcome, we have to change the the system. And yes, you can wait for some all-powerful entity, government or governments, plural, to come along and change the system from the top down. But ultimately, you're going to need a little bit of top-down setting up the right incentive structures and then a lot of participants in the system, whether it's you and me and, you know, in the cars we drive and the the types of energy we use to power our homes, 
we also have to make our contribution to that system outcome. It's the same kind of thing here for modern slavery, that we, Mm -hmm. yes, we do need the right policy settings, um, but we also need individuals and individual entities to take responsibility for the way that, for example, come back to Rana Plaza, the way that they set up just-in-time manufacturing obligations uh, in a way that pushes down risk so far that you ultimately end up with sub-suppliers and subcontractors employing Mm. people in unconscionably risky and dangerous conditions. And then Mm -hmm. it only takes one one, uh, disaster, one literally structural failure in the building, and you have hundreds of deaths. So uh, we have to think about the responsibility across the system, and that means attacking it from every angle. It's a big, long-term system change project, uh, but mm-hmm. that's what ultimately the responsibility of people like me is. Modern slavery is just a host, um, one of a host of human rights abuses that businesses, investors, and governments are exposed to. Um, if if taking action against uh, finding instances of modern slavery and then remedying those instances of modern slavery is just at the beginning, what should the next action areas be, James? Well, I think we have to look to the human rights frameworks to answer that question and what they tell us, what the UN guiding principles and the OECD guidance tells us is that each entity should be focused on the areas to which it's connected to what's called salient risk. So the risk that has the the biggest scope, uh, the biggest uh, gravity and and that's most difficult to remedy if the risk actually turns turns into harm. So not, Mm -hmm. again, not starting from the what do I have the greatest exposure to based on my spend or my level of investment, but actually turning that around and looking from the other end of the telescope uh, to think about, okay, well, I'm connected to which risks which pose the greatest threat to the people who are actually harmed by them. Now, not to seem to be dodging the question and giving you an abstract answer, let me let me make that very practical here in, in Australia where I am. Um, for example, we have very specific issues, long-standing unremedied issues around free prior and informed consent of Indigenous peoples uh, to uh, the particular types of projects that over which they have rights under international law. Really mm-hmm. only in the last 10 years that we've been beginning to think about their rights in those terms here in Australia, and a lot of work needs to happen to uh, bring those, those uh, rights to life. In, uh, in the transactions that we see commercial entities dealing with all the time, particularly in the extractive sector, uh, but not only there, in many others. I mean, another another interesting area, for example, is around renewables and use of land. Mm-hmm. Uh, so there, there's, I think that would be an obvious place for many organisations to start. I actually don't think it's waffling on the question, uh, James, to say, you know, it's that you have to turn the lens around and think of the risks and the people first, and then sort of the boundary second. Uh, I think it's, it's a fundamental reforming that uh, writ large we need to go through. Um, So from that perspective, Um, and then finally, as we come to the end of our time together, James, um, what do you hope to achieve in your term as New South Wales anti-slavery commissioner? So I'm very lucky I have five years in this role, although it's going fast. I'm, I'm only nine months in, but that's 15%. It's hard to believe. Um, I would like to see by the end of of my time that uh, we have a community of purpose that's working together for real freedom. Now, it sounds simple, but there's a few things that actually I would say need to develop uh, in order for that to be truly the case. First of all, much closer coordination and sense of common endeavour. Um, All too often in this sphere, it might be surprising, but because it's a sector that hasn't always been well resourced, inevitably there can be zero-sum dynamics emerge between actors in the sector. We don't, for example, have a sectoral um, needs assessment in this sector. So we don't have individual NGOs and civil society organisations or government organisations articulating clearly to policymakers, this is what we need by way of resourcing to achieve these policy outcomes. These are the intervention pathways that would get us there. So working together might mean that over coming years, we move in that direction, a common understanding of what kind of inputs are needed to produce what kind of outcomes. And then Mm. the second part of what I said for real freedom is that we need to make sure we're we're, uh, really understanding what impacts we're having for people who are uh, at risk of or victimised by modern slavery. And that means uh, really... 
putting survivor voices at the heart of what we do, not just in a tokenistic way, uh, not just for occasional ticker box consultation, but including them in the design, delivery, and evaluation of all of our policy and programming. So I'm thrilled that here in my office, uh, although we've just stood up our first group uh, in the office, only about 10 people now, we have a lived experience advisor, someone with experience in modern slavery, as an employee in the team from the get-go, bringing those voices into the center of this movement so that we actually have user-based design of our mm. policies and practices is going to be absolutely critical. And if we're, uh, if that is normalized by the end of my tenure, I would be very, very happy in that. I'm a, I'm a big personal believer in uh, not for us, without us uh, philosophy. Exactly. So it's really interesting to hear you're approaching this. Um, James Cocaine, the New South Wales Anti-Slavery Commissioner, the first Anti-Slavery Commissioner. Thank you so much for joining us. Pleasure, Rachel. Thank you very much. Thanks for listening to the Greener Way podcast. If you like today's show, remember to rate and review us on your podcast platform and make sure you're subscribed so you don't miss an episode. Any feedback? Contact us on podcast at fssustainability.com.au. I'm Rachel Allen Backus. The Greener Way podcast is a product of FS Sustainability, a show about people, the planet, and investing in our collective future. All information in this podcast is for education and entertainment purposes only. The Greener Way podcast gives listeners access to information and educational content provided by discussing numerous financial sustainable options and our featured guests. It is not intended as a substitute for professional, legal, or tax advice. The hosts of The Greener Way are not financial professionals and are not aware of your personal financial circumstances. FS Sustainability operates under an Australian Financial Service License and the exemption made available under the Corporations Act 2001 in respect to any information or advice given. Before making any financial decisions, you should read the product disclosure statement and if necessary, consult a licensed financial professional. For more information, head to the disclaimer page on the FS Sustainability website, fssustainability.com.au.